Welcome to the Vanity Sports Podcast. I am your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today is Seabass of WNWS of Jackson, Tennessee. This episode is presented by Wellspire, Nashville's Learning and Development Center, which offers personal and professional development opportunities in a beautiful facility in the Gulch neighborhood. Stop by for an event with world-renowned speakers or host an off-site event that will wow your team or your clients. We also thank our co-presenting sponsor, The Well Coffee House, which turns coffee into water and has a mission to bring clean water to the world. Our news today presented by Sutherland and Belk, a Nashville-based injury law firm. Sutherland and Belk is committed to fighting for those who have been injured in car, motorcycle, and truck accidents. Check them out at sbinjurylaw.com. We are recording this episode Wednesday afternoon. The MLB drafts starts tonight. The first round is 37 picks. I would expect to see Austin Martin go early in that draft and a couple of commitments Robert Hassel III and Pete Crow Armstrong should also go off the board in the first round. Rounds 2 to 5 are Thursday night. Those are picks 38 to 160. Our guest line presented to you by our friends at Bowl and Branch. Bowl and Branch was started by Vanderbilt graduates Scott and Missy Tannen. Had no clue what I was missing until I got Bowl and Branch sheets. They are fair trade certified, meaning they are made under safe conditions by men and women treated and paid fairly. Try them free for a month. You can return them, but you won't want to. Once you get the sheets, try the mattress. That was voted the best mattress of 2018. Go to BowlingBranch.com. That is spelled B-O-L-L. Enter the promo code Vandy and get $50 off your first set of sheets. Seabass joins us from WNWS in Jackson, Tennessee. How are you, my friend? What's up, Catfish? Man, I'm doing great. Doing great, man. Just ready to get after it one more time. Do you know how excited I am for the Major League Baseball draft tonight? We are doing this Wednesday probably afternoon. About yeah, probably about as excited as I am. I love a good draft. You know, and uh, the number one farm system is about to get even better after today and tomorrow. I think you're probably right. Uh, the Dodgers are in great shape. And, um, <laughs> <you know. laughs> no, you know. seriously, I, we'll get to that in a minute. But I was thinking this, okay, I think this kind of encapsulates my last six or seven years. And this is what I'm just – First of all, thank God I have something of substance to cover, right? Or of relevance that's like non-controversial and just, we can just talk about that. But I've been thinking, it's like, if you want to boil down my last six years on this job, more or less, I think this fits. It has been covering baseball and everything else has been a soap opera. Well... Uh, to, the, to the first part, you're not going to catch me feeling sorry for you. <laughs> I do a two-hour sports talk show every night uh, and haven't missed a, a show since the start of this whole thing without the benefit of actually having games. So I know exactly what it's like. Uh, so you're looking for something new, something fresh, and and uh, the world of sports eventually always provides, and tonight it's the MLB draft. I hate it's only five rounds, but it is what it is. Well, no, I don't mean it personally. I mean it just think about it. Think think of all the stuff that's happened the last six years. Like I wrote a book in twenty fourteen. And you go back and you look at it, and Vanderbilt had just won a national title in baseball and football was only one year removed from a top twenty five finish. Basketball was what, two years removed from that pretty good six year run. Uh, and about to get better. But man, it's just Really, that's kind of a line of demarcation for where things really started to get worse. I think, it, but baseball's kind of been the constant and all that. And even then, with Donnie Everett, you had a a rough patch in that. Yeah, it's 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 been a, a tumultuous five years on this beat for sure. Um, you know, but like you said, baseball continues to provide, and 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 this year is no different. And you know, it's. You know, it's really cool to read and listen to the people and the different analysts and just talk about the reverence that they have for this program and the players, uh, even the ones who never end up there. You know, the ones who are signed like, a, you know, Hassel and Crow Armstrong, they're never going to play for Vanderbilt. But I mean, you know, 
it, it's 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 amazing to hear people and they'll say, you know, oh, and he's a Vanderbilt commit. You know what I mean? And what kind of what kind of stock that carries, and what kind of weight that it, the gravity of being able to say something like that when you when you see the analysis, uh, it's kind of like, well, the dude is a Vanderbilt commit, so that kind of tells you something about him. And uh, that's great, man. I never thought that some the you know that type of of, of of national weight would be attributed to one of our major sports programs, but it is. I think that the Vanderbilt baseball Twitter account, last I checked, had I think more followers than the universities and the football programs put together. Oh well, I mean, like that's look. I mean, you know, the, which I mean, I'm, you know. We're we're no different around here. People people want to be, they want to be associated with a winner, and that's what they get with Vanderbilt baseball. So you know that's you know if it were football, that would be the other way around. You know, people want to be associated with with a winner, and I totally get it. No, I do too. I'm just thinking that's probably the only school in the country where that's the case, where the baseball is is, is bigger than the university and the school and the and the football program. Um, I wonder about Oregon State, Chris. Uh, good point. That would be one to think about. You know, I would I would think about Oregon State. I think about you know, you know does does Fullerton even have a football game? If they do, I don't remember seeing them. I lost you there for a second. What was the question? I said, does Fullerton have a football team? I don't think so. If they do, it's I know it's not uh, Division One. I. I know that much for sure. But but uh, that might be a possibility. Uh, but very few and far between. Uh, but I think that uh, I, th- I think Oregon State could possibly be. I mean, I could easily check it and see. But uh, if I had to pick one, if you were making me guess another school uh, that might fit that, that would be my my guess would be the Beavers. Yeah, Vanderbilt baseball right now has 149,800 yeah, followers. The university has 52.9. And the football program has. I'm just going to guess. I have no, I'm going to say 15,000. No, I think it's more like 40. Is it 50? I have no idea. Yeah, hang on. This shouldn't be this hard. Uh, 62.2. Really? Yeah. No kidding. Go get it. Y'all. Well, I mean, okay, look, it is, it is an <laughs> SEC football program. But, yeah, let's that, see. That it is. Let's check Oregon State baseball. The Beavers. Come here, Mr. Bean. Let's see how many. Oregon State baseball has 67,200 followers. So Vanderbilt baseball dwarfs that one. Wow. Well, it's the elite baseball program in America. There's, if, if we were even halfway uh, remotely unsure last year, clinched that for sure. Well, it's it's a brand. I mean, it, it is a brand like none other that I can really compare it to. So if they let me ask you this, and of course this is always contingent upon Tim Corbin being there, but like some of these other schools who've had recent success, who've kind of, you know, they're still good, but like a like, like a North Carolina played for two straight titles, and Oregon State played for two straight titles. You know, some of these top more upper tier programs, do they have do they have the stay in power the Vanderbilt does? Because best I can tell, as long as Tim Corbin is there, that's going to be this way. No, I, I mean, he, it's him. He's made it a brand. He's got a magnetism to him. He's got a way of relating to people. He's media friendly. Everybody likes him across every demographic. I mean, really, it, it, let's be honest, okay? Tim Corbin is the brand behind okay. Vanderbilt baseball. You take him away and the Twitter account's probably got 10,000 followers. Yeah. Yeah, it's everything goes away if he does. I think, or at least it changes. You know, I mean, it's now clearly a a, a, a an elite program baseball was. But let's just say that he decided to give it all up and you know become a you know 
a month or something like that and, and move to Hungary, you know, and forget about baseball. And, you know, the job is open. I mean, does everybody in a, in their mother in the world, the top names come, come a call them? I think it depends on how Vanderbilt sells it. And that's a mystery. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to leave it up to that. <laughs> yeah, let's not go there today, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to leave, leave it up to that. But, you know, I wonder if how, how, what the reaction would be, you know. Yeah, I think a because lot of like people said, would. So much of what happens is his, is his doing. You know, it's not just the winning, but it's, it's the way he does it, you know, what he's put in place. And I don't know that that can be replicated by another person. Well, it's – look – it's like the AD search, right? A lot of people would have liked to have that job and their names that people know. And Vanderbilt didn't have any interest in those people. So I don't know if it would handle baseball a different way or the same way, but I think it would be very similar. I mean, I think if you're at Backage, you have to, to ask at least, right? Well, sure. I looked up Oregon State, and the school's Twitter account has 75.6 thousand followers. Baseball has 67.2. Okay. And and what was the other, what, football and the score? So, so the school has more followings than the baseball. All right, so they're not yeah. in that either. Yeah, we're probably the only one in that category. Wait a minute, I think I might be able to get one. You ready? Sure. I think I can do one. Dallas Baptist. Uh, perhaps. You know, Dallas Baptist. What's the deal behind that anyway, Chris? I really don't know. Why are they so, I mean. By the way, Oregon State football has has 77,000 followers, so it has more than its baseball. The football program. And more than us. And and, And more than us. Right. There is that. That's cool. All right. Where we headed? Well, let's talk the draft and the outcomes because let's do it. I think the draft is going to be fascinating for a, a number of reasons. Uh, the it's like every time I kind of size it up and say, "Well, you could see this happen, or you could see that happen." Somebody else says, "Oh yeah, and don't forget about this, or don't forget about that." Just so many unknowns, but I guess the thing we all expect, right, is I think that Austin Martin probably goes to the Orioles at number two, and I think that they probably lose Robert Hassel, uh, probably to your Padres is my guess, although I've seen him to the Reds a good bit today, 12, uh, Padres pick eight. At 12, yeah. And I think Pete Crow Armstrong goes somewhere in that 15 to 25 range, probably more towards the 15 than the 25. But that's my baseline expectation for Wednesday. Thursday is when it gets crazy. Because Vanderbilt's got three or four guys that could get picked, but all of them might also not get picked. I, I think that's unlikely. But you could potentially see... Hickman, Ethan Smith, Tyler Brown, Jake Eater, Hugh Fisher, any one or combination of those all back, right? And think about this for a minute, okay? If under some crazy scenario, everybody came back on that pitching staff, here's what you have. You have starting pitching of Rocker, Leiter, Hickman probably on the weekend, Probably some combo of Ethan Smith and Spencer Jones during the weekdays. You have Tyler Brown closing. You have a bullpen of Jake Eater, Hugh Fisher, Michael Doolin, Thomas Schultz, Sam Laboki, and Eric Kaiser. And that's not even counting Chris Malkawain or Maldonado or if Luke Murphy comes along. I mean, let's back up and look at this a minute, okay? Lighter and Rocker are potentially one and two in the 2021 draft. I saw on fan graphs it had Spencer Jones at number two for 2022. Remember, Jones is a two-way player who hasn't pitched yet, but will next year. Brown is arguably the best closer in college baseball. Hickman's a first-team All-American. I mean, you could literally have debatably the best three pitcher, starting pitchers in college baseball next year. 
on the weekend at <laughs> Vanderbilt. You could potentially have the best closer in college baseball returning. You could have um, a first-round guy pitching in midweek. You could have Ethan Smith, who's a top-five pick most years, or probably will be at that point, top-five rounds, that is. And a bullpen like I've never seen. I mean, who knows? They may lose three or four of those kids, and this this, this discussion is different. But that is why I'm so fascinated with this event because the possibilities, and look, it's not just whether these kids want to take the money, right? Some of them might not get drafted because depending on who you ask, right. opinions are all over the board on Eater and Brown and Hickman. I've only seen in rankings, BA had him 161. The draft is only 160 picks. MLB.com did not have him in its top 200. The Athletic didn't have him in its top 100. ESPN didn't have him in the top 150. So if that's reflective of what baseball people are thinking, Hickman's not going to get drafted. Um, if he does, you're looking at probably, unless a team just falls in love with him, you know, lower end of the, of the fifth round maybe. I don't know. It, it just is – it's unbelievable to me to think of what they could have on this pitching staff – next year if things break a certain way. So, and let me a couple things here. First, first of all, uh, I mean, could it be all possibly so? Because, that, I mean, I'll, uh, Chris, with, with those arms, we could do nothing but bunt the whole year and still win. Uh, you know, I, that, that is an embarrassment of riches because baseball has been, and especially now and always, is going to be an arms race. Agreed? It's an arms race. It's about having the arms. Yeah. How many arms do you have? Uh, we've, uh, I don't think anybody that comes remotely close to that. What? You know, let's just say we live in a world where Mason Hickman does not get drafted in this draft. Uh, where, I mean, essentially he's a six to 10 round, uh, somewhere between sixth and 10th round normally, but because we don't have that, he comes back. Does he, does his place in the rotation change? Chris is, is he, does he go down? Is he the third option? Is he, is he the third guy in that rotation? I think so. Just because when you're looking at top five overall picks, right? Usually, coaches like to highlight those guys a little bit. You don't throw them on Sunday, maybe just for the optics of it. Of course, nobody ever has a three like Hickman either. So, I don't know. I mean, that's that's my guess. But, man, Hickman was the one this year. So, does Tim Corbin flip that around? I don't know. And then, you know, then becomes the question, okay, let's say he is a three. It's like you said, they're talking about showcasing. I mean, how much could he – possibly improve himself uh, from that position right there. And, you know, here the question was asked last night, and it's a fair question, uh, though I don't know what any type of modified draft would look like, uh, but it was asked last night on the MLB Network, is, are the days of the 40-round draft gone for good? And the prevailing thought was, yes, we're not going back to 40 rounds. question becomes now is, what are we going to? We're not staying at five, clearly. But what do we do? What do we go to? And how does that affect Vanderbilt? I'm going to guess it's more like 15 to 20. See, I, I, I was thinking 20. I was thinking 20 rounds. Yeah, because you're going to have, what, 42 minor league clubs eliminated, so you just don't have as many places for those kids to go. Yeah, including taking a chunk out of the volunteer state here. I mean, we're likely to – it looks like we're going to lose the generals. You know, Jackson and, is? You know, I've heard – yeah, oh, yeah, Jackson. Uh, so, uh, is who's another one? I think it's the Lookouts or some one of the teams at East Tennessee is losing. But but you know what's crazy is I've heard reasonings during different things uh, being things from stadium shape, which can't be true. They sunk a bunch of money into that, and it's a really nice stadium. You can see that from the interstate. Uh, and that team has won the last has two, last two, including three of the last four Southern League championships. Yeah, and, well. It, it's 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 terrible. Um, by the way, I think it's either oh, it's Kingsport or Bristol that's going to lose its team. I don't know if Chattanooga is also. Chattanooga's also got a park that's been built in the last 15 to 20 years, and it's pretty nice. It's downtown Chattanooga, 
I wouldn't think they'd lose it. Chattanooga's been double-A and had baseball for forever. But who knows? Yeah, if, if the if where the generals play the ballpark of Jackson, if that's one of the 42, 43 worst shaped stadiums in America, then then minor league baseball is completely thriving. I mean, for goodness sake, in July, Snoop Dogg's coming. You know, it's uh, they. My dog heard heard Snoop Dogg. They're both big fans. <laughs> Sorry about that. But yeah, so what what do you think? A modified draft wise, twenty rounds. What does that do to for is that a positive, a negative, or indifferent for Vanderbilt? I don't think it changes a lot. I mean, kids are tough signs anyway. So all people would do, if you're going to take a flyer on a Kumar Rocker or somebody like that, instead of taking him in round 37, you just do it in 19 or 20. Uh, I was I was sitting here trying to think about that. I, I don't think it should have much of an effect one way or the other, but I think it will definitely affect next year's team with us only having five if some of those players do end up coming back. I mean, that's that's certainly a, a positive effect right there. But now the guys that we know we're going to lose. Uh, first of all, I just want to say something about Austin Martin. Now, if I had the first pick, if I were a news first pick, right? Uh, is that right, Chris? It's the, the Tigers pick Detroit, first. isn't it? With yep. the first. Mm-hmm. Uh, but here's what I would say about this. Uh, Austin Martin going second to the Orioles. I mean, think about the last two picks, the, their last two first picks uh, over the last two years, that being the Orioles. You talk about building a foundation. What about Rushman, the catcher, and Austin Martin? I was thinking I mean, about that today. Yeah, you've got a really – strong potential infield with those two guys. I mean, that's assuming Martin no, plays yeah. infield. He may play center. But what, hey, put Martin in center, and, and you're pretty strong up the middle. Um, and Rutschman was an elite, elite guy. Like, um, I don't know. Rutschman might be better than most number one overall guys. Yeah, he's he's legit. There, I mean, that's uh, you talk about nailing it two straight years. You know, it's you know, it's I mean, it's kind of how the Astros did it. I mean, not that Baltimore's anywhere remotely close to that point, uh, but you know, I mean, if they end up getting Austin Martin with uh, in this draft after taking Rushman last year, that's just a that's it's a, it's a really nice foundation to to start rebuilding everything on, uh, no doubt. Uh, you know, you, you you mentioned a minute ago about Robert Hassel. Uh, possibly going to, to San Diego. I wouldn't be surprised by that, Chris. There's been a, uh, a few years, a couple of times over the last four or five years, where the Padres, right at the 11th hour, really started to lock on to a player for a million different reasons. Ryan Weathers, Ryan Weathers was the case. Remember that a couple of years ago? Yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, on draft night, there was there was zero suspense by then. We, we were, I mean, if it had been anybody else's name other than Ryan Weathers, I would have been extremely surprised by that. And I'm kind of with you. I've been talking to some of my Padres people, uh, and uh, they they, they kind of feel uh, uh, that Robert Hassel is probably the pick. As you mentioned, you and I were talking the other day off the off the air. Uh, regarded by many in the industry as the top prep bat. You know, the question that I, that I read on some of the scouting reports was, uh, you know, uh, that they thought that he was probably a corner outfielder, that he had a steady left-handed bat, that he tended to uh, get into a trouble a little bit more when he tried to, d- you know, display the power uh, that he has it. But, you know, how will he hold the weight and, you know, make the adjustments? I, I, I like the kid a lot after watching him a little bit. Uh, is eight a little early for him? I don't say that it's early for him. It's, I mean, I think he's 10 to 15, but Chris, at the end of the day, there's no difference between eight and 10. If you'll take somebody at 10, you'll take him at eight, depending, upon, of course, upon who's there. But, but I think that's the, the the very beginning of where you could possibly see him anywhere from eight to fifteen. Um, there's a couple of players I'd kind of rather look at, but hey, you know, if 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 you can snag the top prep Matt, and you know, especially from the left-handed side of the plate, which is something they're certainly tr- trying to do, I, I think that Hassel makes a lot of sense at eight, eight overall. 
I'm seeing him go a little higher in mock drafts than I am in terms of where places have him rated. In other words, I see him 8 to 10, maybe 11 or 12 consistently in mock drafts. You see prospect lists. He's closer to 14 or 15, or maybe not quite that low, but there's a little bit of a difference. That usually tells me that's an organization that thinks it can sign a kid for what it wants him to, maybe a little bit below slot and apply the savings elsewhere. So it's interesting to see him mentioned to San Diego for that reason. You know, the other thing is, you know, that's an organization that seems to have cleared out a lot of outfielders. Now, maybe it wouldn't have mattered because those guys might have been gone in free agency or traded anyway. But in the last year, they've gotten rid of Margo and Hunter Renfro and Fran Reyes. So that's an organization that would seem to have a need for outfielders. Well, you know, but what, what they, they – yes, but you have to factor a couple of things in here. First of all, remember, they drafted C.J. Abrams, and, I, and, and he killed it as a rookie last year. Uh, he's a guy that, uh, you know, there's a couple of different uh, schools of thought of where he ends up. I think he ends up in center field. Uh, and then you remember they traded for Taylor Trammell, uh, who they really like a lot uh, on one of those corners. So I think you're going to see both of those guys who are both very, very young, uh, but very close, uh, making it. I think those two are going to be part of that outfield. Uh, so uh, I think they're looking for one or two more, uh, going to Petco. So I'll match up. Anything else on the draft you'd like to get into before we hit the mailbag? Uh, no. What about you? I'm just looking forward to it tonight, man. I can't wait. I mean, I'm going to be on the air, but I've got MLB network on the TV in my studio. And, uh, by the way, have an interesting interview tonight, Steve Spurrier Jr. Very nice. You know, he, yeah, he's, uh, you know, he's been with Mike Leach up, up in Washington. And now he's down in Stark. He came to Starkville with him. Uh, really going to, you know, I, you know, I'm not going to do the whole, what's it like being Steve Spurrier's son? You know, uh, I, I, it's, it's going to be a lot more about Mike Leach. You know, and, and how he thinks this all translates it. You know, how how, how this, the you know, how Pac-12 football is going to translate into Starkville, Mississippi. I'm excited about that. Uh, but, yeah, I'm going to have an eye on the draft all night long. Yeah, to me, from a Vanderbilt standpoint, day two is more interesting just because that's when you've got five pitchers who could potentially go. Uh, and, and really, I I just think that, I mean, like if, if some combination, if either, if any of Marsh or excuse me, any of Martin Hassel or Crow Armstrong got to Vandy, I think everybody would be stunned. So I've just kind of had that as a foregone conclusion. And you never know. This year's different, so you never know. But to me, that's that's what I'm watching more. I'm I'm very much looking forward to tonight. By the way, as a Braves fan, I'm seeing Bryce Jarvis slotted to the Braves in a lot of mock drafts. I'd be completely happy with that but to me from a Vanderbilt standpoint I think day two is more interesting and throw, by hey, the way throw Enrique are... Bradfield in there too the outfielder from American Heritage High School in Florida because I think they've got a, ch- a chance to get him through the draft he won't go <laughs> as a first rounder I'd be stunned if he did but they think they've got a chance to get him through and get him on campus Real quick, before we go to the mailbag, in regards to the fact that these kids did not get to play their, their their senior years in high school, how much do you think that had an effect? Or if we're talking about the caliber of player uh, that is, you know, first, second, third round, that enough has been done on them that people know what they're getting. What do you think? Uh, I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. Did you not hear it or you need me to say it again? <laughs> say it again. Okay, I said with the seniors in high school, the ones that are about to be, uh, you know, or the ones that were just were who did not get to play their senior year. Do you feel like the type of player that, you know, those first, second, third rounders from the prep level uh, without being able to play their senior year? Do you feel like there's enough scouting on them that clubs know exactly what they're getting with them? Or do you think the fact that they didn't get to play their senior year hurts them and their draft stuff? Well, that's a great question. That's been talked about a lot. The consensus that I'm hearing when I'm listening to things is that because of that, 
organizations are going to go for the more predictable. I mean, and you look at mock drafts, right? It's very college heavy. Now, a lot of that's because it's a tremendous college class. I mean, this draft is one of the best I can remember, maybe the best in terms of talent, say, in that top 100 or so. But I think the predictability element, not only are these kids older, not only did you get to see them a little bit more in the spring, but yeah, I think that plays in. And like the quintessential case for that, I think is probably the Ed Howard kid out of Chicago that I think is a commit to Oklahoma. You're seeing him maybe around 15 to 25 in a lot of mock drafts, but I think there's some uncertainty there. And that's a kid that organizations would have liked to have seen a lot more. Uh, There's a kid out of... I want to say Pennsylvania that's kind of popped up. I cannot think of his name, but he is going to skip his senior year. He's probably going to be a first rounder, I think. I want to say somebody told me he threw 105 in a bullpen the other day and had it on video. Yeah, I know. So it's – yeah, I think what happened is it probably deprived some high school kids of a chance to rise up. And I think when in doubt – Teams may go with the college player because of that. So, uh, 105? I mean, how do you even... Well, hey, it's I, like I a Roldis Chapman unfair. territory. Uh, yeah, but that kid's in high school. Yeah. yeah. So, or maybe, oh, maybe, it's a, maybe I'm mixing two kids up, but there's been a few stories like that where... Uh, some some guys popped up out of the blue, and organizations didn't have a chance to really evaluate how that would have played in game time. So real quick, and, and there's look, I mean, there's nothing for you really to base it on, I don't guess. But uh, as those numbers like that continue to trend upwards, where there's nothing, spe- there's no, no longer anything special about a 98 mile an hour fastball. Uh, so in 2040. In 2040, uh, when David's in his 20s, you know he's probably out of college by now. What are, what are the top major leaguers, the the hardest throwing major league throwers? What what are they topping out at? Oh, I think we're reaching the limits of what a human arm can take. And you know what? It was. I want to say it was 2014 or 2015. You had like 40 guys in the draft that year that had hit 100. It seems like it's gone down a little bit. I don't know if it's more testing for performance-enhancing drugs or something like that, but I think we've kind of seen the limits of what people can do. I don't think you're going to have somebody throwing 115. Yeah, yeah I, I think so, man. What I mean, once you imagine... Tell you what, Araldus Chapman... Uh, in a game once through, what was it, 30-something pitches in a row all over 100 miles an hour? Yeah, I'm something, you know, that, I, that kid was, unbe- well, still is unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, that that's just pure filth. You know, do it once is amazing, but when you top 130 pitches in a row, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's amazing to think about where we can be, you know, where we can go. You know, or could you imagine uh, to, to taking a time machine and putting a roll this Chapman like back in the twenties, and saying, "Hey, babe, hit this." You know, and, and some of the players back in the old days saying, hey, "Have a swing at this." You know, here you go, Lou Gehrig, try to catch up with a hundred and five. Yeah, I wonder yeah. sometimes if we, and this is a whole other topic, if we don't overrate some of the old timers because I just don't think they played against anything resembling the competition that we have now, but of course they also didn't get a chance to have nutrition and training and advances in travel and technology and things that players do now. But that's another interesting conversation. Take a, let's take a, let's take somebody interesting. Let's take somebody that's a good baseball player. Uh, not a superstar by any stretch of imagination. Well, okay, here you go. Let's take a guy. He was number one overall, one of the greatest players ever at Vanderbilt, who's a very good baseball player. He's not quite what the hype was yet, at least yet. But let's take Dansby, Dansby Swanson and, and transport him back to the 1930s. See, see the greatest player in the, in the, in the entire decade? 
That's a good question. Or I was thinking, like, what if you take a guy that's that throws 96, 97, 98, and is a three or four on most teams and put him in the 20s? When you maybe saw that from Walter Johnson and, and who else? I don't know. How does that play? Or let's let me ask you this. If Ty Cobb were being drafted tonight, you know, all, all the measurables and everything he has the met, and, and everything is what it is, what it was in his prime, and he were being drafted tonight. I wonder where he would go. Oh, I think Cobb would translate. Don't you? To today? Yeah. I think so. Now, now you might <laughs> where he, where he go. You might not want to give that guy a Twitter account, but. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, what's, uh, what, what's my man's name? Uh, Trevor Bauer. <laughs> he has one. Yeah, but um, Trevor Bauer would get in trouble for different reasons than Ty Cobb. Um, although, although to some, to some degree, we're product of our time, right? Um, that's fair. But Babe Ruth is the one that I wonder about. Um, you know, cause he, the, the womanizing and the drinking and the stuff, and a lot of guys just showed up to the park hung over. Right. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if, if the spotlight, like you, cause you could never do that today. So I don't know if that would have no. made him a better player or if it would have, would have broken him. Of course, you know, he might have shown up at the ballpark hung against people that were running over too. That's also true. Okay, I'm looking at the clock, fat boy. I'm thinking about a mailbag. All right. Today's mailbag is presented by Vanderbilt fan and independent insurance agent Josh Minton of Brentwood. If you need home, auto, motorcycle, renters, landlord, life, or commercial insurance, Josh is the guy to contact. Call him at 615-933-1979. Email him at josh at hqinsurance.com. Follow him on Facebook at J.D. Minton HQ. He is my insurance agent. Give him a try, and I think you'll be pleased. Vandy Fitz says, given our players and other teams haven't been on campus and around their teammates for unofficial practicing seven on seven, et cetera, what differences do you expect in the scheming or play calling in college football this fall? Will it be more vanilla than we're all used to? Will it be especially so for Vanderbilt with new coordinators and offensive and defensive mindsets? I think it might be, you know, I mean, look, I, I know that I'm sure they've had their zoom meetings and, and they've gone over things and they've talked it, but they haven't been able to physically implement that, you know, and, 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 and go through and go through reps and snaps and, and get the proper instruction and correction. So while they might be uh, verbally familiar with it a little bit more, uh, I, I think the, the physical implementation with a coach right there with them and the, and the lack thereof is, is, is there's going to be a little bit of a, you know, it may be one of those things where you have to simplify it at least initially, don't you think? I don't know how you don't. I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I don't know how you could. And Arbor you don't learn. You don't learn that, especially with, with all these new coaches, you know, and they have to get familiar with personnel, not just what they saw on film from this team last year, but what this player's like, you know, their tendencies and what they are as a person, uh, how they can, how they can, you know, because you got to find a, you, you got to find the player's buttons. And I don't mean that in a negative light, but what makes them tick. And you can only really do that by being out there with them. Ready for the next? Uh, yeah. Ann Arbador asks, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, Mason's defenses had both 4-3 and 3-4 sets. There seems to be speculation we'd move more towards a 4-3. Does this mean, one, there'd still be some 3-4 four, four sets? Two, should we expect less of a learning curve slash transition for the team to learn this defense if we are changing to more of a 4-3? Well, I mean, I, you're really the best person to ask this one here because even though it was limited, you get get to see a little bit of what they were doing in the spring when they, well, yeah, at least initially. Yeah, well, key is a little bit right. They had three or four practices. They were just breaking stuff in. Um, you know, th- there seemed to be a lot more of it, but you know, th- they had three or four practices. I got to see about half of it, so. That's where I am. You know, one thing that we we learned initially, remember when initially when Derek Mason came in and converted a three four, 
you know, one thing that we talked about then, because this is a, this is a little bit more gradual. It's not going to be a little bit easier, uh, but you know, schematically and personnel wise, I mean, they got to be a fit. And 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 one thing that we had to try to do, at least initially, when Coach Mason first got here, well, was recruit that way. You know, for players because there are players who, honestly, Chris, there are. I mean, I know we talk about people. Well, he's a perfect fit for this. He's a perfect fit for that. And there are players that are like that, and that's absolutely true. You know, but a lot of players on this level are. I mean, scheme versus not just position, but scheme versatility uh, is, is there as well. I, I mean, you know, I. I don't see it being a major, major issue for them right now. To me, the bigger issue any, of, of anything is is Ted Roof and 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 being able to get in, implement their implement the verbiage and and all this other stuff. You know, and just getting familiar with them. But it's been a gradual switch, you know, and kind of a mixture. So it's not like uh, when Derek Mason first got here. Remember, Chris, we were moving from a four three to a three four, and remember how we kept everybody. The conversation was this is good couple of years no matter how good he is and at that time we expected to have outstanding defenses because of what we saw in Palo Alto that hasn't happened uh but that was the expectation but that even with that it was going to take a minute as we converted you know from one D style to the other you know that fit one the other. But we're kind of bleeding it in and mixing it last year or so and and, and going into the spring. I don't think it'll be quite as difficult. I just thought of something that I cannot believe we have never got into on this podcast before because we've been doing a lot of what ifs and things like that lately. But what if Derek just comes in and says, you know, I'm going to run something as close to what they ran with Bob Shoup. I'm not going to go to a three, four and let's just ride with that and see where it goes. What did the last six years look like? I don't know. The only reason I say that is because we we've been so bad defensively. You know, well, I mean, it really yes, never but <laughs> but let me give you a counterpoint, okay? Um, I, I know good and well a lot of the issues they had in 2014 were just kids were. And, and and probably if they weren't organized to begin with, it probably would have fallen apart. But there was just so much confusion with kids on that defense about what they were supposed to do, and it couldn't have hurt. Right. Yeah. No, I mean I think the results would have been a little bit better. But you know the, the, the truth is, which is why I feel so much better about the personnel on the defensive front that we have right now. I mean, some of it's still unproven uh, and it's only on potential, but the caliber of player that they're bringing in at that position uh, is certainly better than, than it was. I mean, we've been getting manhandled at, you know, at the line of scrimmage in a bad, bad way. We, we haven't been able to do anything that even remotely comes close to stopping the run you know, in, in a long time. And, and I think personnel wise, we are, as, you know, we have a, as good a chance as we've had in the past five or six years of doing that. Just on, I mean, we had Adam Butler, you know, at the end of his career uh, for, for that. But other than that, I mean, we just haven't had those type of guys. There's a couple of guys on campus right now. You know, Davion Davis, Derek Green, uh, and, and even a guy that's committed into this class, Tyrion Sergic. These are type of players they didn't have uh, when he got here, uh, for the most part. And so that can make up for a multitude of sins because we've just been getting blown off the football. I mean, I don't care if we were running a, a 10-1, uh, you know, a, a, a 3-4, 4-3, whatever it is, you know. Four four three, whatever it is, we've been getting destroyed on the line of scrimmage, and I think that we have the type of players now uh, that have an opportunity to do something about that. But yeah, I mean, I, I, it's kind of an interesting thing. What if that had been the case immediately? I mean, that's you know revisionist history, but I mean, I I would have to think it would have been at least a little bit more effective for sure. Last one, Vandy Fan 96 asks, what is a favorite football tradition, Vanderbilt football tradition that Seabass has? What tradition would you like to see improve or implement? Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, you said you had to go, right? <laughs> man, you know, I, here, here's what I'll say. 
for my experience, one thing that I, I really love um, and I get real proud about, you know, and it's generally when we're playing much better and the numbers are there. But, you know, when the star walk is crowded, Chris, you know, when the star walk is packed through there and the players are coming out and they got the anchor and everybody's hyped up and you're playing well and you're feeling good. Being right there at the star walk, because I like to get right there when the players coming out and hollering at the players and the coaches. I enjoy that a lot. I, I, I do. Uh, so, I mean, because we don't have a whole lot of like traditions like you're saying. So I guess if I had to say one thing it would probably be the star walk. And with that, we have hit the end of the mailbag. So do you have any closing thoughts before we end today's show? Oh, uh, man, I was almost said something that probably got me fired. And I don't even work here. Uh, no, no, man, just, uh, you know, uh, now the one thing that I, we didn't talk about today and, and I, I, I don't really know the details. Uh, maybe you do a little bit better. I'm sure you've already podcasted. In fact, I know you did this about will there, will Vanderbilt be playing football this year? Uh, all I'm asking for you to do is tell me if you were a gambling man and you were putting money down on it, uh, and you had to go one way or the other about whether or not we're going to play, you would put your money on. I would put my money on they play. Okay, because I can't even believe it's a thing, but it is. Thank you. Is if the other thirteen teams can find a way to play and we don't. I don't care about the logistics. I don't care about any of the other things. They do that, and I'm out. And I know you hear people say that all the time on the board, but that would be – I mean, I've been here for 47 years. That would just be uh, – at this point, you know, you can only kick a dog so many times. Uh, I, that, I, I, I could not get past that. that. That would be too much for me. My friend, tell people where they can find your show and where they can find you on Twitter, please. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Cheat Seats Bass. Of course, 101.5 FM Monday through Friday, 6 to 8 p.m. on the Cheat Seats. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chris. He is Seabass. I'm Chris Lee. Thank you for listening to the Vandy Sports Podcast. We are probably done with episodes this week. Make it one in after the draft, potentially on Friday, depending on time and guest availability. But if not, thank you for listening, and we will catch you again next week.